one airline, uh, having been in QSA, incident response, and building security programs, the kind of places where you'd learn about POS malware. Yay! Okay, so happy to be here. For everybody who missed the movie last night, I thought I might as well give like a short highlight, right? Because I almost fell asleep in it. I mean, it was good. It was excellent. So, talk about stock markets. If you don't know what Stuxnet is, it's a good movie to get a refresher. Had some pretty cool tools, um, helicopters, rafts, gun battles, deserts, and all that cool stuff just for being a hacker. I am in the wrong job. But life every day, right? Lear jets and guns. So. This talk does not talk about that. <laughs> so that was the exciting part of it. So, no, this talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about POS malware. So who am I really? I'm a senior security analyst. After Bruce's talk, I need to call myself a cyber security analyst, I guess, and I gotta get that passed by the, the powers that be. I'm a QSA, um, I'm a CISP. I've been in the security world for nine plus years. Who do my wife? friends think I am? Well, I was walking my dog the other day and I kind of waved to my wife's, my wife's friends and she came home and said, hey, my friends called and they think you're a spy. And I said, well, why do they think I'm a spy? And they're like, well, okay, you travel around the world, you work with computers and we really don't know what you do. <laughs> and I thought, okay. And she goes, so I said, you're not a spy. And then she says, you're not a spy, are you? <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm a salesman. No, I'm not a spy, because I've never flown in a Learjet. I've never had to investigate a nuclear meltdown, and I've never been involved in a gun battle in a foreign country. I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> That's a need to know. So, But on a regular basis, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is work with companies to deal with sensitive data, help them implement security policies and controls, and actually, I've had my credit cards be compromised, right? The last time I was, i just gotten back from Mexico from a trip, and my credit card company called me and said, hey, we've got unauthorized charges on your credit card. Were you in Mexico City? And I, I was like, yes, I was. Which card is this? And I had to think about it. I'm like, I didn't use that card in Mexico City, although I was there. But over the last three or four years, I've probably had four or five cards compromised. But you can see why with some of the breaches we've had, They've been some pretty big names over the last 13 months. And according to statistics, oh, probably one in five, one in four people in this room have had a credit card compromised or had a information actually stolen. And that's a disturbing trend for me. You know, even less disturbing was I wasn't surprised when Staples came out this Christmas and said, hey, we've been breached. You know, Target was last Christmas, Staples this Christmas. I'm just kind of curious to see who next Christmas will be, right? So why this talk? You know, I wanted to take and analyze what was going on with merchant locations. I wanted to look at some of the things I've seen as far as attacks I've investigated, uh, look at what attackers are doing, how they're getting into systems, and then actually take a look at defense, how uh, us as security professionals can help avoid some of these things from happening. Because of NDA and stuff like that, I had to go out to make sure I didn't breach any confidentiality and use a lot of public sources. There's a lot of crap out there that's actually written in the media and news. So it took a little bit of filtering, but I think I've got most of it right. And if you don't agree, I think there's schmooballs somewhere. So, but I have a shield. So just warn me. Secret Service in August actually uh, announced that there were over a thousand merchants that had been compromised by back off POS malware. And that was a disturbing trend considering it was almost just over halfway through the year and if we're at 1,000, um, I'll be interested to see what the reports are actually at the end of this year to see if, how many actually it was. Last I heard it was about 1,400. But what does it do? You know, in a merchant POS structure, as you look at merchant POS systems, typically you have this swipe device and when you swipe your card, all the credit card information goes in clear text fortunately or unfortunately, depending on if you're the attacker or the defender, to this computer, this POS system. And a lot of these POS systems are Windows embedded or some type of Windows system. 
and then they open up an SSL, I mean, <clears throat> after Poodle TLS, I hope, connection to the acquirer to actually process the transaction. So the attack vector for a lot of attackers is this POS system itself. And what happens with the POS system is attackers are getting in, they're in a variety of methods. Um, some of the best I've seen are the third party vendors, you know, that was the Home Depot and the Target ones. But we see insider threats and social engineering and any way attackers can get in to actually put malware on these POS systems. Uh, and it, they're doing it in a really smart manner. They're taking and figuring out what applications and what programs are running on merchant systems or even in banks in this case. And they're saying, okay, let's look for the vulnerabilities and let's monitor the vulnerability list. And once we monitor the vulnerability list, then as vulnerabilities come out, we can reverse engineer them. We'll use those to attack systems or we'll, uh, we'll use those to attack service providers and banks. If we can't figure that out or if we don't know that, that's fine. We'll just go to the third party vendors because as you get a lot of third party vendors out there, um, or a lot of large merchants, they always use third party ven vendors. And they're going to go ahead and say, okay, we're going to use those credentials, log into some system where we can pivot, and then we're going to go ahead and attack the systems. And we see that happen a lot. You know, it's an email fish, as we saw in the HVAC vendor of Target. It's uh, some type of scraping to steal usernames and passwords. But it's not just merchants that are effective. Every time I see a target or every time I see a compromise, the first thing that comes out in the news is, hey, we'll give you a free credit report. So the attackers, I think, got pretty smart and said, well, if we can steal the email list of Target or Chase Bank or whoever, emails were compromised, why don't we go ahead and steal their data too? And we'll send out this cool, like, little generic email. This one, I think, originated from, like, Iran and terminated in Denmark or somewhere, saying, hey, you may have been compromised. We don't care if it's your bank or not. Um, go ahead and give us your private information so we can sign you up for free credit reporting, right? So now I've got an identity theft on top of my POS malware. So as I start to look, as, as we start to analyze and break apart the attack vector, uh, we also see things uh, like this come out in the news. The U.S. CERT, when they came out with their article, I thought was excellent. They said, okay, actors, okay, I think they meant to say attackers, but okay, Attackers are using publicly available information to actually go ahead and compromise these systems. So I was thinking to myself, I have a lab, so I thought it would be cool to see what it would actually take to do this, right? All I have to do really is go and steal a bunch of emails from a compromise. And we use these email lists in a variety of methods. So if we're attacking a company directly, what we're going to do is we're going to take email lists from a compromise. We're going to go ahead and strip out everything that has that domain name. And then we're going to go ahead and now we've got all the usernames for that company. All I have to do now is figure out how I can get in and brute force the passwords, right? The other way we're using the list is people are like, oh, change your admin name. Well, that's cool, except for this list also gives me a list of usernames that I can commonly use. Because in many cases, I, I would say in most cases, for businesses, you end up with usernames that are same, the same as the login names, especially if people have been in companies for a long time. You know, way back in the 90s, before some people hit their teenage years and stuff, all of our email accounts typically ended up being the same um, as our Hotmail and our Yahoo and our, our Gmail accounts, right? So we have the same username in our corporate environment as we do in our personal environment. Because that's just how we did it. We didn't really think about it. So we could take this username list. We grab a password list that's on the internet, or we'll take the passwords that have been compromised, and we'll go ahead and put together a password list so we can attempt to brute force, right? So I don't care about password complexity anymore. I don't really care about, you know, these changed usernames, because if I can find a list that's accurate, or at least not accurate, I may be able to get a foothold into a system where I can go ahead and attack. So I put this together in my lab, and I thought, okay, well, how hard can this be? Well, let's find out. So... If the demo gods love me, they might um, shine on us today. So, so really it has to do with fingerprinting systems and stuff like that. Um, so I go ahead and pull up my tech tools. Where are my tech tools? My handy dandy favorite scanner. Look for remote access because we know that the two major forms of compromise for merchant environments are SQL injection and remote access protocols. 
There's been plenty of talks on SQL injection, so let's look at a remote access talk. So I grab it. I'm going to search for uh, an open port. I'm going to open whatever scan range I want. Right? I can scan the internet. It's not really hard. If I'm in an organization, I can go ahead and scan a, a subnet or what it, a country. It doesn't really matter. I kick off my scan, and it'll just go through and scan and look for open ports. And it could be an RDP port. It could be a Logmium port. Really, whatever is an open source that doesn't require me to have a two-factor authentication. I take my results, and I just parse them out to a little file. And then I open my handy-dandy little publicly available brute force tool. Right. I go ahead and load my files that I found vulnerables in my IP list. Load my little logins. If I'm doing a generic attack, in this case I am, I'm going to load like the most common logins that, although we've told people for decades to change their ad, admin and administrator um, usernames, they don't. So, and I load my password list, and uh, I configure that. We'll see if it works. And I start my brute force. And all it is is a brute force. So if I'm worried about password complexity or if I'm worried about lockouts, um, Trend Michael came out and said, oh, put in your lockouts and stuff like that. And that's fine. I just do five passwords and cycle and five passwords and cycle. It's not a big deal. So I run my brute force attack. And then we go ahead and, and parse out our results. Once I get my results parsed out, oops. I think I shall be nervous. Yeah. Cheese does start with C, someone just said. And voila, I'm in. Now, this was actually came from an attack that I investigated. So, And these were the tools that were used, or a version of these were the tools that were used. So this is like a real life, real case scenario. And we keep on seeing this in the news that, oh, people are using remote access tools to actually break into systems. It's not that hard, right? Um, and that's kind of the scary part about it. So once attackers are in systems, then what are they doing? Well, it's not like an attacker is going to go to every target POS and say, okay, well, let's go ahead and and compromise each system individually, why not use the tools that the merchants and that the environments already have, like a software distribution system? Why not use your Puppet server? Why not use your um, WSUS server? Why not use your Nagios or whatever you use to distribute software to go ahead and push it out to all the relevant systems? We saw this also in the Home Depot breach, where they were like, wow, it was all our like, self-checkout lanes that were all of a sudden compromised and then everything else. Well, the reason for that was all the self-checkout lanes had some like machine name called .pos, right? Well, I wonder if that's a POS server. Most likely, it is, right? Um, and the same thing happened with Target. So once we're into the system and once we can figure out how to distribute the malware out and about, then what do we do? Let's take a look. So what does POS malware do? It's simple. What POS malware does is it steals track data or any other type of data that I want to steal from memory, right? So it's not stored file locations. We're not trying to compromise databases. And then it sends it out to the black market. So as I started to investigate this strains and all the reports that were out, we we're starting to see that each strain of malware is a little bit different, but all of them have a lot of the similar characteristics in them. Um, we're seeing attackers create malware from pre-existing versions. So once I sell it out on the black market, well, why would I do that? Well, it's because I can make money, and I think that's why it's so proliferate, is if I can make a quick buck and I can target these large merchants that have a lot of credit card transactions, why not go out and sell them um, at a black market somewhere? And as you start looking at the black market sites, you can see that we can, I can buy stuff based on zip codes. So now if I'm in D.C., for example, and I want to get like a D.C. or a Virginia credit card, um, I can do that for 10 to 100 bucks and use it a couple of times and throw it away. So now I don't have to worry about the credit card company's geolocation or fraud detection or anything like that. Um, and I can use it to create credit cards to pay for like hotel rooms and laptops and, and things like that. Um, and I can either sell my merchandise or I can get free trips, which is awesome. So until you get caught. 
So what's inside of it? So typically when we look at RAM scrapers, we're seeing multiple components actually formed into a single binary. Um, they've got network functionality, they've got update functionality, a lot of them have logging and monitoring, um, they'll have a call home or they'll have kill switches, so if an AV detects them, they go ahead and delete themselves. We see them stored in memory, and we see them stored actually on the disk itself. Um, up till in 2013 or 2012, we even see development kits that have been developed for them. So now it's a lot easier to go out and say, okay, here's what kind of the components I want in my malware. Here's what I want it to be called. I've done my investigation, and so we're going to name it similar to executables that were in the merchant location I'm attacking. And here's where I want it to be stored, and here's the type of information I want it to take. Um, and then we see articles like this that are a little disturbing. So this was a semantic uh, analysis on InfoStellar Read and B, which ended up being the malware that attacked Target. And as you start looking in the compliance world, people are saying, well, look at all your high vulnerabilities and look at the ways that you need to protect against them. Well, we see these analysis come out and they're like, well, it's a low vulnerability because we think it would be hard for people to actually get this malware onto systems. They pulled this actually three days after the target breach was announced for some reason, so, right? But that's what we're seeing as far as the analysis goes. So I thought, okay, well, how, how long has this been a problem? Because we started reading about it and it hit the news really hard this year, well, last year and in 2013. Well, it's not a new problem. In fact, it's an old problem, and it's been around for a long time. In 2008 in Europe, Visa actually went out to its merchants and said, whoa, time out. There's this like malware thing that's doing RAM scraping of, of credit card data. You've got to be careful of it, right? Well, back then, they were using Windows debug tools to actually go in and scrape memory then. In 2009, the Verizon data breach report actually reported it, and they're like, well, we don't really have a category for it. But we think it's going to be an issue, and like 6% of the merchants in Europe are compromised with it, so be careful, right? You fast forward to 2013, and their report said, okay, now we've got our own dedicated category for it because they've gotten smarter, and 14% um, of breaches in 2013 were responsible for it. We'll have to see in the next few months when the report comes out what the 2014 numbers ended up being for them. So as I started to look at it, and after you got out of the Windows debug tools, I wanted to say, okay, let's see what's really happening, right? So the f earliest version I could find to analyze was in 2011 with RDA Serve, and then you jump forward to um, 2012, almost a year later, uh, Alina came out, and you saw Alina, and then you started to see a whole Dexter and V skimmer, or VS skimmer, and VS skimmer was the first one that had a dev kit to it. And after that, it just kind of exploded, right? So you had vSkimmer, Black POS, Chewbacca. And Chewbacca was cool because it used Tor to exfiltrate data, right? And I thought that was awesome. Well, why not? So now I can't figure out where my command and control server is. I can't figure out where they're exfiltrating data to, right? We saw the target info stealer read them that Symantec reported on. And then Decibel in January 2014, this was kind of the next cool thing I, I saw was Decibel used VB script. It was like 400 lines of VB script to actually put this malware in place. And I thought, okay, I haven't seen the Python script yet for it, so if someone's got it, I'd love to look at it, right? But it's coming. I don't think it'll be too, I don't think it'll be too bad. But so we see the timeline as it goes forward, you know, and even in December we had Lucy POS come out. So it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. But we see the same components in the earlier versions be used for the later versions, you know? The components that we saw in RDA serve and Black POS, we saw used in Brute POS. Um, Dexter kind of evolved into Soraya. I haven't seen any evolutions of vSkimmer or Chewbacca or Decibel yet, but I'm kind of waiting and I wouldn't be surprised if this year we start to see some of that come out. So what does it do? Or where do the files sit? In Almost every case, we saw all the files for the malware sit in the user's app data directory. And there are executables that sit in the user's app data directory, or the app data is some file location, right? And they're all named to win common Windows processes. You see iExplorer or Java or some hooks into Explorer. Um, and almost 100% of the time, that's the case. Uh, the only exception I found was in Chewbacca. It added itself for some reason to the start menu program. 
um, in this bull serve. And I thought, okay, I guess that works if you aren't really monitoring that location, which most people weren't. So, but in addition to that, we see them have additional attributes. You know, not only do they steal RAM and look for credit card data, but they start, we start to see keyloggers put into place. And we start to see logging put into place. And we start to see system analysis. So system profiling. And we started to see information leave with the credit card data, like here's the version of malware it has. Here's the number of systems on the network that have been affected by it. Here's the computer name. Here's the IP address. Here's the admin credentials. And so we see a lot more information than just credit card data actually go out. So what does it do? Well, the ranch scrapers are pretty simple. You know, what they do is they actually take and enumerate all the processes in Windows. They go ahead and uh, they have a blacklist of processes that typically don't give a lot of good information. And then they just read each process. And as they read each process, they'll actually look at the memory, the heap, and the threads, and they'll do regex to actually find the data they're looking for. In most cases, it's credit card data, but I say find the data they're looking for because it's not necessarily credit card data. If I'm targeting a dev shop, or if I'm targeting a bank, or if I'm targeting a tax administration, why not look for social security numbers? Why not look for source code? Why not look for um, encryption keys? I can look for anything I want in it. The only reason we POS malware has been so proliferated, I think, is because that's where I'm getting the biggest bang for my buck. I can go out and sell the data pretty quick on the black market, but what prevents me from now stealing your keys? What prevents me from now stealing your passwords or all of your PII information if you're a medical clinic? Uh, in most cases, it's going to add itself to the auto start run key. Uh, the key loggers are going to grab the information from the web forms or anything else that they feel is necessary to look at. And as it calls home to the CC server, we're going to actually see it ask for updates and then update itself. In the target breach, we saw it update itself like three times before they actually noticed what was going on. And then we see the bot functionality. Right? We see it say, okay, I've got this system in my network or in my VLAN. Let's go see if we can get all the other systems as well. And then the exfiltration methods were as varied as the, um, the attack methods, right? Um, anything to avoid any type of data loss prevention program I'm going to use. So if I can hex encode it or if I can base64 encode it, or if I don't really don't care about the company and I know they do a crap job in security, <clears throat> then I'll just send it out in clear text because no one's going to notice it anyway. Uh, and it really doesn't matter. I'm going to probe for my ports, and if I have email access out, then I'll send it out email. If I don't, then I'll try and FTP it. I'll move it to a different server within the environment. But if all else fails and I really don't want it to be seen, why not just create an SSH tunnel or a TLS connection out to a CC server and exfiltrate it that way? That way, when it passes through my... Um, data loss program and my and analytics, all it sees is encrypted data and, and it's HTTPS, so it should be secure, right? And it originated from within my environment, so I don't see why that could be data I don't want to lose. And that's a lot of times the common things I receive. And so I see a lot of interesting trends as far as the malware goes. You know, the dev kits are available. You know, we've got scripting languages now for malware, so we can go out and actually get scripting languages for it. But we're also seeing that it's not necessarily for credit card data. We're seeing passwords being taken. We're seeing encryption keys or certificates being taken. And we're also seeing it capture additional types of data. Uh, some of the disturbing trends, and I think this is where some of the compliance regulations are, are falling a little behind. You know, they're a lot. They're really concerned with stored data. You know, protect data at rest. Well, this isn't data at rest, and a lot of times it only resides in memory, so it's never data at rest. Um, we're seeing it take on ATP type characteristics, right? It's evading anti-malware programs. It's on the system for an incredibly long time, and it's using a, whatever attack method it can do, use to get in as well as get out. And we see disturbing trends, you know? You know solution provider charge anywhere said, oh, wow, it's been on our system since 2009. You know, we're really disturbed by that. Well, I'm really disturbed by that as well because other things we've seen on systems since 2009 would be like rain and Stuxnet and stuff like that, right? So we're using the Veil frameworks and we're using the tools that we have at our disposal to make sure it's not detected by, by AV programs. As I took apart one of the info stiller, raw POS is what compromised Goodwill. And I was able to get a timeline as we started to investigate 
what had happened, right? And what had happened was they first found it on the systems and as far back as February 2013. Well, who knows how long it was there before? You know, it was discovered and Goodwill was, um, was notified in February 2018. So there was a year that we could actually take um, credit card data. But the first AV program didn't really have a signature on it until 2000, the September of that year. So we've got 19 months of actually execution and stealing data that we can use before it's even discovered or even assessed by an AV program. And that's, we know that. Everybody in this room should know that. That we can't rely on our AV programs, but we have to use them uh, for the, like this stupid stuff we miss, right? So I just wanted to take and sidetrack just a minute and talk about EMV because I got really irritated with all the news articles that said, oh my gosh, EMV's coming to the US and it's going to be like our save all and like everyone's not going to have to do like PCI compliance and that's for the people who want to drink, right? So, um, and yeah, your credit card data would have been secure and it, no, you're wrong, right? Well, let me just tell people they're wrong. Let's see why. So how EMV works, and EMV has some good security measures in it, but it's fundamental. In some cases, if the banks don't implement it correctly, it's going to be wrong. So EMV is that little chip that sits on the credit card, and in Europe, you have to put in a PIN number with it. In the U.S., we're going to implement the EMV with a signature base. So you put in your card in the reader. It's going to, your credit card number is going to be encrypted on the chip, and then it's going to be decrypted right there and sent in clear text to the register, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's encrypted. Yeah, it's encrypted on the chip, right? We still need the credit card number to process the transaction. But what makes EMV a little more secure, what should make it secure, is that, EMV, that card now has a counter. So now I have a transaction counter, and then I have a cryptogram, right? And so with my credit card data that's now in clear text, which means I can still use it for like e-commerce fraud, um, that counter is sent off to the issuer and, as well as the cryptogram to be authorized. And so if the counter doesn't match up, then it should reject, reject the transaction. Or if the cryptogram is checked and it doesn't match, then it should reject, reject the transaction. Except for, then we see companies and car brands coming out and saying, well, let's do this cool offline authorization, right? And what the offline authorization does is it says, okay, we're going to accept your credit card, and if you don't hit our floor limit, then we're gonna, we'll take the counter and just like store it till the end of the day, and then we'll go ahead and process it, and if we still think it's probably good, then we'll authorize the transaction, right? Well, the problem with that is, if you like to shop and you go on a shopping spree, I may have like six of these offline, offline transactions or authorizations and the banks are going to have to say, okay, now what range are we going to be able to accept for the counters? Well, if I can take a credit card and typically with these credit cards, we'll take them and we'll clone them and we'll use them within the next two or three days, right? And if we use them within the next two or three days, we may hit that kind of medium where the counter is still valid even though it's not in sequence. And so, there's, I think there's going to be issues with the credit card companies with this counter, especially if they don't do stuff like um, the Brazilians did, and check the cryptogram, right? So we still see that EMV, um, although the card and the chip, I haven't heard it as being compromised yet, there's still ways to get around that, right? We saw this in Brazil last year when a bank, a New England bank, started to see these EMV transactions and they started to authorize them. Because they authorized them, you know, because they're EMV, they must be secure, so let's go ahead and authorize them. And they, they were like, holy crap, we've got like 80000 or $80 million of fraud. We don't understand it. Well, let's investigate it. Well, what happened in Brazil is the attackers figured out that the banks were all preparing for EMV and they thought it would be really cool to get it set up. And so they said, okay, well, let's turn on our EMV systems. And like the bank, New England started to investigate and they're like, man, we've lost all this money. And they're like, well, time out. We're receiving all these EMV transactions that we're automatically accepting because we know they're secure, but we haven't issued any EMV cards yet. <laughs> There's a problem there, right? So if banks don't do what they need to as far as checking cryptograms or making sure that their systems are set up, I don't think EMV is going to save us. So I think the banks still have a lot of work to do. Um, 
and it just happens. And, you know, congrats to the Brazilians and shame on you, I guess, right? But it was brilliant. And they did a replay attack. So they were taking merchant terminals and they were actually swiping cards and then they were capturing that and doing a man in the middle and inserting the EMV chip. And that's how they actually got the transactions to be authorized. But the cards they were using came from the Home Depot breach, right? Well, let's just take cards that probably weren't EMV and put an EMV chip on. Now we can get them authorized and it really doesn't matter what country we're in. And so uh, the attackers are getting smarter and we know that, right? So let's talk about defense because no one's talking about defense. You know, we see it all over the news. And I think I've only heard like one talk about defense. Because if we have to, def if we know what the attack vectors are and we know how it's getting onto our systems and we know where it sits on our systems, then let's do something about it. Well, I think the first issue is to actually do something about it, right? If you're an executive or your executive staff knows there are issues in your IT infrastructure and knows you aren't doing anything about the alerts or anything like that, or they don't put the proper resources in place and the proper personnel in place, it doesn't matter what we do. We can put in all the fire eyes we want or we can put in all the IDS or logging systems we want, but if we don't put the staff that are knowledgeable to run those, it's not gonna do us any good, right? Let's put in an IDS system. You know, if I'm gonna brute force a system, it's gonna be pretty apparent that I'm trying to brute force a system, right? Pay attention to the alerts. It ticks me off when I go out and they're like, yeah, we're totally secure. So where do your logs go, dev null? What the hell, right? What do you mean they're going to dev? Well, we don't have time to do it and we don't have the resources and so it just became too much noise so we just send them to dev null, right? Why did you spend the money on the system anyway? It doesn't do you any good unless you're actually going to take time to do it. This is like the unsexy part of security, right? It's cool to attack and it's cool to look at the cool stuff and, uh, and stuff like that. But this is kind of the unsexy, like br brutally honest part of security. We have to look at our IDS and we have to figure out or get the resources in place to actually figure out how to protect companies or protect ourselves and figure out how to get rid of the white noise. I was out on an engagement and they're like, yeah, we've got our IDS set up. And I'm like, well, how many alerts do you get a day? And they're like, none. And I'm like, fail, right? You don't have it configured correctly. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I was just call me, right? When you configure it correctly. So at like three o'clock in the morning, I get this call and they're like, what the hell is going on? I'm like, what? And they're like, we're being attacked. And I said, why? And they're, our IDS totally exploded. And I said, okay, you're on the right track. So you know, congratulations, you actually turn on the right bits to actually start to get some noise on it. Because they're noisy things and so are logs, right? Restrict access. I don't know how many news articles I've seen that say, you know, do two-factor authentication. You know, it's not like a brain, it's not like a light bulb that goes on and says, oh, maybe I should do two-factor authentication. We've known about it for a long time. There's tools out there that make it really easy to implement, right? Don't allow, like, vendors period, to log directly into sensitive systems. You know, if I'm a vendor and I say, okay, well, I need to fix something, that's fine, let me just put you on a WebEx or let me let you log in and I'm gonna go out to lunch and just call me if you have a problem. Sure, that's smart, right? We investigated a breach or I was working in an incident where it was the vendor who was actually compromising the systems. Yeah, we logged in, we needed access, we went ahead and stole a whole bunch of credit card data and then patched your system, right? Okay, well, we could have known that if we had actually monitored what they were doing while they were in, inside. Um, you know, don't let unnecessary people actually get into your systems, you know? Let me give you this third-party vendor that this third-party vendor uses the same password for all their customers. That's brilliant, right? And we keep on seeing it happen over and over. Yeah, but we think they're secure and we trust them as a vendor. Yeah, but did you ask them if they're using the same password credentials for everything else? No, we really didn't know it. Did you know they just got compromised because like two of their other vendors, they use the same credentials and the same password to get in? Oh, yeah, maybe we should look at that, right? Let's put together vulnerability man management programs that are comprehensive. Not just, okay, let's do a little checkbox and let's say, okay, yeah, do we have any threats? No, I think we're pretty secure. The fire extinguishers are in place. Our doors are locked. We have badges. You know, you can't clone those ever, right? Um, let's do it. Let's figure out how 
people are getting into systems. You know, if I'm all I'm monitoring is my logs from my external access, but I'm not doing anything to monitor my file location. We're not doing anything to say, hey, time out, why do we have executables running in the user out data directory? I'm not doing a good enough job. And there's plenty of resources out there, right? Look at the threats and look at the feeds. They're, um, skeleton key just came out like two days ago uh, saying, hey, we can get like AD credentials for all these servers. And then there's analysis on it to say, here's the binaries that you can look for. Here's the locations that they are, where they're located within systems. Here's the memory locations they are. And then let's configure our, our logging and our alerting and everything to monitor those, lo those locations so we don't get our ADs that are popped or we don't get malware that's sitting in our systems. If I look at my app data directory or if I look at my temp directory and say, well, why do I have these like strange logs or why do I have these additional files? I should only have like si seven Windows files in this directory and now there's 13. That should be like my huge red flag to say, okay, there's a problem, right? Look at resources from cause. My favorite of all time Social engineering lesson was Tom Sawyer, right? Yeah, let me go out and convince all my buddies to do this chore of painting this fence that I really didn't want to paint, right? But learn how social engineering works, you know? Take a look at the talks from the cons. Dave, Dave Kennedy in DEF CON last year or two years ago gave an excellent presentation with a demo to a company that said, here's how we're going to use SET, the social engineering toolkit, to go ahead and compromise the system. Well, we can learn from that as defenders to say, whoa, now we got to do employee awareness and say, time out, don't click on like these strange links that people tell you to go to that don't even have the company URL in them, right? Last year in DEF CON, there was an excellent talk. I'm not like a malware person called ADD Complicating Memory Forensics Through Memory Disarray by Jake Williams and Allison Torres. And that was awesome. That was kind of the first time I said, whoa, time out. Malware is always sitting almost in um, the app data. And what that does for me is when I go out to my customers and on my engagements, I'm like, look, you need to monitor app data. And I go, well, why? And I'm like, because I told you so, but if you don't believe me, go look at these resources, right? Because as I look at the analysis and I, as I learn how the attacks are happening, then I can turn around and better educate the people I work with to say, here's what you need to look out for. Here's what you need to do, right? We need to configure logs correctly, you know? It doesn't, logs are noisy. We know logs are noisy. And the first time InfoSec Weekly had a podcast with Michael Go, and he did a great job of, of talking about Windows logging and the things you need to look for and how you correlate logs, right? And what he said is, you know, look at your static servers. Look at your POS systems that shouldn't change a lot. Look at your application servers that shouldn't change a lot. You know, workstations are kind of different. But look at these systems, and if you start to see crazy stuff like new processes created, on these static systems that don't have a change control associated with them, then do something about it. Because no one authorized that, so why is it happening? You know, These systems typically don't get logged into on a regular event. They typically don't get shares connected to them. And they, in, in a lot of the malware we see, we see the login, a share access to map a drive, drop the malware, and then a disconnect. And it happens within just a few seconds of each other. And so as you start to correlate these events and say, well, why do I have all these like weird uh, login connect, disconnect from this administrator when admins really shouldn't be accessing the box? I can look at that in my logs and say, okay, time out. There's some type of pattern here that's not right. It doesn't feel right. You know, why do I have new services being installed on my system? You know, look at your file auditing. As you go out and say, okay, let me monitor these certain directories, and any time an executable is dropped into app data, fix it, right? There shouldn't be any executables running app data, period. If there's stuff dropped into temp and it's not something you authorized, then do something about it. Look at your Windows system files or your critical system files, and you see, as you see new files added, that don't deal with the change control, then do something about it, right? So use the event codes to your benefit, you know? And if you wanted to practice and figure out how to filter out your white noise, do something like Splunk Storm. You know, do something to say, okay, I can upload a certain amount of logs to Splunk Storm, get a free account, figure out how to filter out my white noise, and then take care of it, you know? One of the things I talked about earlier was insider threats, you know? With insider threats, we see a lot of insider threats happen. Uh, CERT actually came out with an, an article that they published in one of their podcasts 
where they had investigated some 317 breaches having to do with insider threats and espionage. And with insider threats and espionage, what they found was it was all across the board. We saw the same thing with Chase Bank, you know, and we saw the same thing with Discover um, earlier, where a user had access to systems he had normal access to, but he downloaded content that wasn't authorized, you know. Uh, all the account information of like all the high level accounts or all the, the most earning accounts. And the corporation started publishing them on the internet. So there's resources out there to combat both external and internal sources. And CERT came out with a list of like 19 things that you could do to actually um, combat insider threats. So um, that's it. That's all I got. I want to open up to questions because there's a lot of people here. Thank you. Question. Tell me about your thoughts on the impact of Apple Pay. Tell me about my thoughts on the impact of Apple Pay. Apple Pay rocks. I, I like Apple Pay for two reasons. Um, one, Apple Pay actually puts out a token. And so as I process transactions, and it's a unique token, it's, for every separate transaction. So I can't steal that token, from what I understand, I'll be corrected here in a second with the shmoo ball if I'm wrong. Um, if, I, if, I, if I capture that token and try and replay it, it won't work, right? If I capture that token and try and use it for another transaction, it's not going to work. It's one of the beautiful things of tokenization. If you implement tokenization, and I think Apple did a good job with it, um, then it's a great way to actually protect your sensitive data. That's a great question. So, other questions? Wow. It's, question. Wait, there's two questions. Sorry. Let me do you and then you. Sorry. Oh, great question. So the question was, why go through the trouble of scanning memory? And the, why go through the trouble? One, it's easy to scan memory. And if I have my correct patterns, it doesn't matter if information comes in over serial, comes in over Ethernet, comes in over USB. It all goes into memory to either be sent from memory out to processing. So in, there are a lot of applications out there that don't, don't actually store data to disk, right? So it doesn't do me any good to scan to disk. But if I scan memory and I can enumerate the processes that give me valuable information, then I can get it as it's passing through because it'll always sit in memory. That's a great question. What's the other question back there? You got to speak up, like la yell or something. Uh, why do POS systems have access to the internet? If you look at a lot of card readers, like if I go to a parking meter or something, it's going to have access to the internet in many cases, right, without a POS system. Um, that's the way they configured them, because as you create that SSL tunnel, there's nothing that says, I can't reach out for authorization in any compliance regulation. Now, as to your second question, why do people have direct remote access to um, those types of systems? You know, because they're stupid. I mean, they shouldn't. You know, that's the whole thing. And one of the things I work with companies on saying is, time out, you shouldn't ever have direct access to these sensitive systems, regardless of what type of sensitive system it is. You know, I want you to go into like a jump, a bastion host or a jump box, so I can analyze that traffic still through an IDS, but then I get kind of that second degree of separation for access. You could potentially, yes. If you set up your firewalls correctly, the question is, you could potentially be affected by malware, and it could do nothing if you had the appropriate controls in place. And the answer to that question is yes. If you look at how malware is trying to exfiltrate, and on my inside zone, I block email, and I block FTP, and I block file transfer, and I do HTTPS out only to my processors, it doesn't matter what malware is sitting on the system. I mean. It, it's bad that it got there to begin with, but I'm not going to lose all the data. And that was, 
that, that was kind of the sad part of Target and Home Depot, right? Like Target, they found it. Like they saw it with the logs, the exfiltration, and they caught it then. Home Depot didn't catch it until it was actually out on the black market, right? And that's when people are going, hey, we think you've been breached. Like, well, why? Well, we've got like 30 million credit card numbers of years out here. So great question. Question, speak up. Yeah. So, no, typically it wasn't a problem then because it's really hard to attack the last mile of, from the telco to your business, right? And so a lot of those attacks, when you start to see the modem-based attacks, you're looking at physical injection. You're, you're going to get like Mike Osman coming in and putting a tap in to, to capture that modem data. But because it's not internet and it's not publicly available and stuff, it's almost a point-to-point -point connection to the telco. So, well, everyone's leaving, so I guess I'm done. Thank you.